Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Meter Cute interviews here on Meter and Mayhem. Today, we'll be talking with Evelyn Berry, a trans Southern writer, editor, and educator. She's also a recipient of a 2023 National Endowment for the Arts Poetry Fellowship, who lives in Columbia, South Carolina. Her book, Grief Slut, will be available in 2024 from Sundress Publications. So sit back, relax, and get ready to fall in love. Hi, I want to start with a poem called Sacrifice. All of the poems I'm reading today are form poems, since we're going to be talking a lot about form and um, meter. Sacrifice. In the beginning, a small lamb split open upon an altar, blood spilled from a body still warm. This is how some men worship, a father's blade against the neck of a boy, his son a vessel of obedient sin. How else to cleanse sin except to slaughter the lamb, gush warm as the thigh of a boy, a body bathed in another's blood, learns how to properly worship, shudders, gasps, then goes still. What remains still is the question of where sin seeps when the body ceases worship, how even what is ruined becomes lamb when cleansed in blood, a field of limb-wrecked boys. The splatter of a boy becomes blood-born worship. He grasps my head like a sacrificial lamb. I clean my face and still taste the sour tart of sin, metallic, almost like blood. A new song enters the blood, cleanses the body in antithesis to worship. How miraculous the factory of sin. What slips in through the boy's mouth corrupts every organ until stilled, an altar without a lamb. This is um, a form that to many people will be pretty familiar, um, the Sestina, except it is a truncated Sestina, one that um, ends a little too soon, um, which I hope says something about the nature of the poem. Um, I'm going to read a poem that is new and unpublished. I'm reading, by the way, from my book, Grief Slut. You can see it right here. Um, and I'm really excited about having this poem in the world. I wonder if you can see it. Yeah, here it is. Um, so this is the poem over here. And then there are footnotes <clears throat> for each little stanza. It's called Boyhood Revision. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, start. Footnote one. There exists no cheat code to reverse this, to revert, to remember him as anything other than a gender-muddled boy. Professor Oak asks, are you a boy or a girl? No, I cannot remember which he picked. If anything, I've scraped memory until it is a scrapbook of convenient snapshots. He's in second grade and learns to cartwheel. He walks on his hands. He never learns to tie his shoes. He never learns to bleed without crying. Footnote two, he asks to sign up for gymnastics but gets placed on the football team instead, only turned upside down when colliding with the ground. At Boy Scout camp, he learns flint, steel wool, nest of straw and twig. He learns to build a fire. He learns a campfire song coughed through smoke. He learns to knot his brainstem. He learns to take a punch. Footnote three. Become a man. He must first arson whatever vestiges of femme he has left. He scrapes and scraps and scales trees. He knuckles his brother's face until his mouth bruises vermilion. Footnote 
for. No, don't say vermilion. Primary is color palette. Say red. Studies show women experience colors differently than men. And suddenly, the hues of sunset seem too dysphoric to witness. The pills I swallow are not blue, but instead periwinkle. You must wear the costume, cargo shorts held up by a braided belt, graphic t-shirt, dirty socks, footnote five. Go ahead, tell them. I don't care. He once slipped into his friend's sister's room. He tried on her clothes. He stood in the mirror and imagined himself femme as a keychain switchblade. Goddamn. What a cliche. This memory is the one I point back to and say, see, I knew then, if I can make sense of my body, it begins here. I did not want to mourn him, but I cannot let him keep living in my body. Footnote six. Sometimes he feels like I'm disfiguring the family photos when I distort my voice. I retcon boyhood into eligible elegy. I'm trying to find something worth saving, something of him worth time capsuling in the dirt of me. I swear, I do not want to forget. Footnote seven. Here's a version of this story. Once I was a boy, then became a bird. No, once he was a mischief maker, then became a magpie. No, once he was a body, until I thieved the right words for home. Once my mother named me for what she believed to be the last time. I'm going to read one more poem. I want to share my screen with you because um, I think it has a really unique form as well. I wrote this poem um, based a little bit on the language of um, like coding languages, similar to like Python. So this is a poem called How to Build a Body. Body, text, how wondrous this instrument, how strange, Flop atop a table, wait for storm to wake me. Lightning transmutes data into flesh, soft as self in transitory sameness. Xerox replicated from counterfeit electric carbon copy automation. So feathers with a glass needle, name myself after the smell of rain, winged in between. Vessel, breathing apparatus, ghost coughed from the cracked screen, machine in the image of man. Error, error, error. Define body. Simulacra of sparked synapse. Collapse prone architecture. Accident of bond tipsy electrons outdated appliance, used model, ancient technology, artificial grief avatar, clustered codex of cellular ruin, sepulcher of synthetic skin, invention with faulty circuits, split screen desire, manifest, a miracle, brilliant bone, Origami, the first mistake. Wow. Thank you, Evelyn. That was, um, I, I was writing, I would like write down some of the lines that I really loved. And then I would realize I was like missing the next lines that I also was loving. Like, um, what was it? It was, um, thieved the right words for home. Mm. I just, I love how that poem, you feel like when it starts, you're going to be getting just like a ah, nostalgia poem. Mm. But then when you get the footnotes and you're getting this layer upon layer of depth that takes it to a whole nother place. I, oh, I loved it. Um, You know what? I also, I also really love that. That's my seg. That's me segueing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really love, um, you do a lot of um, 
Well, I think you originally do them on TikTok, but I see everything on YouTube because <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm almost 50. So everything's on YouTube. Um, but you do these really great things about different, different forms and different writing terms that just makes everything super accessible. Um, mm -hmm. I love the way that you have of summarizing the writing terms and, and bringing people in. So I'm kind of curious to know what is a poetic form that you're in love with? Yeah, um, a poetic form that I've recently been obsessed with is the burning high bun, um, which in the grand scheme of things is kind of a new form. So just some background. Um, I don't really have much formal poetic education. Um, I did take some poetry classes in college, but don't have an English degree, don't have, have an MFA. Um, so like, of course, while I was in college, I was curious about poetic forms. You know, I'd write a little sonnet every now and again. I think I tried and failed to write a lot of Sistinas. But only recently have I actually really invested time in trying to use form creatively and also um, challenging myself to write in meter. So I'm writing a lot of poems right now that are, mo all of them are pretty much unpublished at the moment, or most of them are, that are all in like, they're just like all these like perfect sonnets. And I'm really obsessed with the like, okay, I'm going to have like, what if I really try to have like a perfectly rhymed, perfectly metered sonnet? Um, and of course, it's really hard. And I think that sometimes we dismiss form as like elementary or easy. Um, and we also dismiss meter as like oh that's something I did in like eighth grade I'm I'm beyond that you know um but I I think when we say that sometimes it can be a way of tricking ourselves that we are capable of doing it easily when it's actually much harder than we know um so I've been really um exploring forms and one of the forms uh that I came across in the past like two years or so is the burning high bun um, I'm going to actually read a definition of it because I think that will help um, explain what it is. So the Burning High Bun is a form developed by the poet Torin A. Greathouse. Um, Torin A. Greathouse is a, um, a trans poet, um, uh, someone whose work I, I really kind of like uh, look up to. Um, and this is an alteration of the traditional high bun. So to explain a traditional high bun um, is a Japanese haikai form, uh, which was popularized by Basho in around like the 17th century. Um, so basically what it is, it's a prose poem. It's a like prose block followed by a haiku. And that haiku that follows the prose block can be... Um, you know, maybe a uh, almost thesis statement of what is being described in the prose block or kind of amplifies or introduces a little bit of a volta into what the, the prose poem is, um, which is a really cool form in and of itself because, you know, you have this almost like maximalist form of the prose block and then you have the haiku, which I feel like is often the epitome of like the little succinct aesthetic phrase. Um, and the burning haibun further develops the haibun basically by creating a system um, where the poem literally burns away. I'm glad we have screen sharing because I'm going to show it to you. So here is a burning haibun. Um, do you want me to read it? Yeah, sure. That'd be, that'd be great. Okay. I'm going to show it to you first. So you can see the, the prose block here. Um, this is Dancing in the Dark after the song by Bruce Springsteen by Torin A. Greyhouse. And, um, you know, you kind of have this prose block. And then in the second one, it is a, an erasure of the original prose block. And then in the final stanza is a further erasure of the erasure um, in which you end up with a haiku. Wow. So it is a like high bun, but with some extra steps so that it's a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to read this and I'm going to kind of talk about um, Torin's ideas behind it because I think they're very interesting. I recently taught a workshop all about the burning high bun. Um, we do some like local queer 
um, workshops and we had one on clearing form. And I think people, um, it's kind of a difficult thing to answer, like, what does it mean to queer form? It's something I really like to do that um, with the footnotes, for example, like how can you use form to complicate a queer experience? Um, like you said before, like it's almost a, you know, when you're putting footnotes on your own memories, like that's a pretty trans thing to do in my opinion. Anyways, here's the poem. Dancing in the dark. I spent summer cloistered behind the curtain of my room, chest wrapped in a stolen bra and panic sweat. Woke each morning, ribs checkmarked with the red echo of skins dreaming but it might become. First, learned the failures of my body and what a lover abandoned. Saw in her discarded clothes my chest as absence. Sold the whole season on a dream of looking like someone else. Danced with a candle's soft pirouette of smoke. Springsteen crackling in the speakers like harsh light across a mirror's torn silver skin. He sings, come on, baby, this town, they'll be carving you up. You gotta stay, baby, I'm sick of this. And I want to sing back, finish this broken lyric, body. I let the song play over and over till Bruce's voice fails him. I want to press my lips to the hole his voice has burned in the dark and ask him if he ever stopped wanting to change. I stand in my bathroom with all the lights off, clothed in nothing but the word man, the first lie I ever stripped off my tongue. I shave down to my scalp. Each strand ignites. Hair of brilliant wicks stubble to sparks, lighting my face, leaving a silhouette of ash. I spent summer behind the curtain of my panicked sweat. Each morning, checked the skin my lover abandoned. Saw my chest looking like a candle in the mirror. I want to finish this broken body. Over and over, I press my lips to the dark and ask to change. Stand in my bathroom, lights off. Clothed in man, the first lie of my tongue. I shave my hair to sparks, my face ash. Check my look in the mirror. I want to change my clothes, my hair, my face. I like that um, this actually ends like with roosting uh, Bruce Springsteen's like lyrics, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. So what I really dig about this um, form is kind of what it allows you to do. Um, do, 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 do. So like uh, Turing kind of explains this idea of the burning high bun as um, a way of like burning away the interior landscape. So um, thinking about how memory or experience is um, fragmented by an experience of trauma. Um, so like in this case in particular, you know, um, she is like writing about the body and writing about this like dysphoria and wish to transition. Um, and as she is contemplating these ideas, she is also like reframing and burning away her own kind of memory or experience of, of that memory, um, which is like a very weird thing to think about doing through a form, uh, which is why it kind of fascinates me a lot. It also fascinates me because it's really difficult. I've probably tried writing four or five of these, none of which have turned out well. Um, but I, I find them really fascinating, especially the idea that you have to, you know, end in that haiku. I think it's really difficult. Like you're not just writing a haiku, you're writing a haiku out of what has come before. Yeah, and um, I, have, I have so many thoughts from what you've just been saying. Um, so was was Dancing in the Dark, was that her first burning high bone? It was not. Um, there's another um, one that was also published by Poetry Magazine that was called Just Burning High Bun. Um, and I think that's kind of where I first saw it, um, which was basically about her 
it was it was about like alcoholism okay. which was really interesting because like alcoholism obviously opens up another avenue of like the ways that we literally destroy memory through like the consumption of alcohol um I'm like really fascinated by that as well like I write also a lot obviously like a lot about alcoholism and substance abuse and stuff like that so um I don't know it is fascinating and there's also a really great essay about it that's like kind of where I got my notes from called um writing from the ashes that she published um alongside the poem that I just read where she kind of like walks through it and that's all on the poetry's website right yeah yeah okay. so it's free if you like google it I'll send you the links as well if you want to include this excellent yeah I'll, I'll put them down in the description so that folks can can find them or even maybe I'll get super fancy and I'll I'll put the link down below while we're Ooh, talking even <laughs> love that <laughs> we'll see if that happens um I just one of the things that I was struck when you were reading the poem is that there's so much within that poem itself about burning and yeah. fire and flame and, and ash. And so I thought, oh, maybe this was the first one. This was sort of the impetus, but no, that was, it came after, so. Yeah, and what interests me too is like, um, once I started looking around, like like any poetic form, similar to like, um, I think another form that is this is happening to is the duplex uh, that Jericho Brown helped develop where, you know, he like kind of develops this form and makes this like form that is his. And then obviously people are writing after him or like writing that form as well, which I find really fascinating. I think that's like a wild thing to do to like originate a new form or a new variation on a form. Like that's some gold. We'll see if I want other people to write coding poems or right. I think the footnote poem has been done to death. So I can't claim that, but um, we'll see. <laughs> you know, one day maybe we can write some like truncated sustinas or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I'm just, yeah, I'm really excited about that and seeing how other people use it. And what's also, I mean, interesting is because of who this poet is and who she's in community with, a lot of the other people using the former also trans. Um, so I, I feel like it's this especially trans form. I think that anyone could write it and do something really interesting with it. Because, like, I think once you consider the ways in which, like, history is erased or experience is erased or, you know, anything that kind of um, interacts with trauma, I, you can do some super cool stuff. Yeah. Um, do you ever find yourself, um, you said that you had tried to write a number of the Burning High Bonds. Do you ever find yourself feeling like, oh, well, this has failed at the form, this isn't quite working right but you have stuff that you can use in other ways that you've kind of opened doors to some other poem that you wouldn't have gotten mm -hmm. to otherwise. Yeah, um, I was looking through, uh, so two things about that. One, like almost all of my poems actually start as form poems. So almost all of my poems are, um, especially these days, like start as sonnets. Um, and then I switch it up or, I will have some really complicated like procedural method for writing them. Um, so lately I write almost all of my poems based on this like very wild thing um, that I do uh, that helps like, I, I think makes it sound interesting. Um, and it ends up usually, you know, resulting in poems that might have like one or two lines that I steal for something in the future. Um, and, and, you know, that's, a, I mean, I think it's just kind of fun to do that. Um, and I think it also kind of opens up a different part of your mind. Like, you know, I love the sonnet because it forces me to write words in an order that I would have not otherwise done. <laughs> and then there's like that one line that's like, okay, now I'm going to take this and this is going to be the poem. <laughs> um, having said that, though, I do think it's really funny. I think this mostly happened in revision, but um reading I you know have, have had to read this book like a million times in the past couple of weeks um and there's like so many poems in here that are either 13 or 15 lines that are like almost sonnets but like I can't even bring myself to to do a you know I'm just kind of like winking like yeah this could have been a sonnet if I cared <laughs> you know, it's very <laughs> it's it's very disrespectful um but kind of fun that's awesome. Um, 
Well, that's got me thinking. Is there any advice that you would give to sort of a younger version of Evelyn or just, you know, younger poets in general or what advice would you yeah. give? I mean, it's that's an interesting question because like writing wise, I don't know if I would want to give any advice because I am, I appreciate where I am right now. Um, and I think that I had a bit of bullheadedness when I was younger that has actually ended up serving me well, even if it was um, embarrassing at the time. But like, I'm kind of an intense person. And I'm also someone who has been delusional since the age of like 11. Uh, so like, you know, I was a teenager writing novels and like sending, you know, query letters to agents um, and being like, I'm a 12 year old writer and I'm going to be the next great star, you know, or whatever. Um, but like having done that, like when I feel like I developed a really intense relationship with like um, the habit of creativity really young, which I think was super important because um, I just have never given that up. And then also it made me a little bit more used to rejection, like way earlier. Like by the time I was 18, I already been, you know, rejected by publishers and like 50 literary magazines and stuff. But I'd also already been published, you know. So like wow. by that point, I kind of got the gist of things, um, which I remember being in college and my friends were like not sending their work out. And I was like, this is great. Send your work out. I mean, it doesn't it might not end up in the biggest magazines, but it might get published anyways. Um, and what's kind of nice looking back now is that some of those things may have not really mattered. It's kind of like, oh, no one's probably going to ever even find the poem I published when I was 19 because, you know, it went into this little zine that sold three copies and then went out of print. But it was important for like my own um, poetic journey. Um, so like, if I was talking to young writers, like the big thing that I try to push them to do is to um, put their work out there and also to take themselves seriously as writers. Um, I think that too many young writers think that they have to earn a certain level of education or prestige before people start listening to them, you know, um, they say, you know, I'm I'm getting my English degree. Like, no one wants to read my my undergrad poems. Um, or, like, they might say, well, you know, I'll start trying to publish after I get my MFA. Once I, like, have, have earned the right to be listened to. And I think it's really important, no matter what um, you're doing, that, like, you know, even that early work um, might speak to somebody, might connect you with somebody. Um, also, practically, it might help you, like, build your career. Um I'm in a really lucky boat right now where um, like Grief Slut is my first collection, um, but I've published like so many zines and chat books at this point that I've like already been on tour before. I like know how to write a press kit. I know how to market. Um, I have like an audience who like wants to read the book. Um, and that's like a, you know, that that might seem uh, shallow, but I think it's, it's a really good thing um, that you can kind of like connect with those people. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I also am like a big proponent of like starting your own thing, especially when you're young, like start your own open mic, start your own journal. I think is the best thing you can do at the age of like 20 or 21 is like start your own literary journal and just like publish all your friends in your city or whatever and print it at your library and hand it out, like whatever you need to do to get your work out there, like do it. Um, cause like, it's not all that serious. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know, maybe that's a mean thing to say, but like, I don't know, you could just do it <laughs> yourself. Um, and I don't think you need to wait around for permission to do it. And I think that was like a huge thing that I've learned, um, when I was younger that has served me super well now is that now I can kind of have this confidence in what I do because I, I've really <laughs> learned how to, um, be rejected or, how to navigate that world. Yeah, and so I'm trying to think, I feel like there is some snappy little phrase that I've heard before that summarizes sort of what you're trying, what you're saying, but I can't remember what it is. It's like, take yourself seriously, but don't take, 
it's like yeah maybe never... like take your work seriously but not yourself too seriously yeah yeah that's <laughs> yeah totally uh, yeah and like also like right obviously I think that's a wild thing where people like I was I was like write write I mean I was writing books and like submitting them you know what I mean from a very young age and like even poetry collections I probably have submitted to like book prizes and publishers since like 2015 um which like I'm glad that the book that I was sending out wasn't published because it wasn't very good <laughs> but like I don't know I was trying I was like confident in myself I was like this is the this is it. You know what I mean? This is so great. Um, and I think like the other side of that are people who think, well, I can't even like write a novel yet until I like take the class how to write a novel. I can't even attempt it. And it's like good to attempt and fail because you will fail. Um, so like if you fail early on, you might get it out of the way a little sooner. Um, <laughs> not that you won't also fail. I feel like I've learned that lesson as well. Um, I'm still failing all the time, but I, I think that um, there is a secret to failing faster. <laughs> failing faster, fail harder. <laughs> <laughs> fail, fail again, try again, fail better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. What advice do you think um, a younger version of you would have to give to you? Is there something you've forgotten or... I don't know. I wonder. Yeah. Um. I mean, I think that a younger version of me would find me a little bored. Like they would be very impressed, but also uh, bored. Like, oh my god, you're so boring. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you need to do more crazy things. Um. But yeah, I I think that maybe um. Like uh an ambition or like a um kind of reckless self-regard um would be something I could relearn about myself maybe that's not the best thing to relearn at this point in my life but I feel like I have like a really intense um idea about who I was and what my life was going to be which of course none of that happened um <laughs> But, like, I think it's not bad to kind of um, have, like, kind of big ideas for what you're going to do. I mean, even, like, I'm saying big ideas, like, the things I was thinking about were, like, I'm going to leave South Carolina and go elsewhere to a big city. <laughs> yeah. Maybe to other people, it's, like, not a big deal. Um, but to me, that's, like, massive. I just, like, moved to a small city for the first time in years. Um, and that felt like a massive, scary move in my life. And um yeah but it's been it's been nice I've been trying to embrace that as I'm like trying to market this new book where I'm like you know what it's okay reach out to that bookstore reach out to that magazine reach out to that like reading series or that university like the worst thing that can possibly happen is that they say no or they ignore you and you know then you're just right back at square one but if you don't ask if you don't try if you kind of like self-reject um, then um, you might never know that you might get the thing that you want to do or do the thing that you want to do. Yeah, I um, and I, I think that's a lesson that we learn over and over in a way. Um, because right now I'm I had my first book picked up and I'm trying to get blurbs, mm. and so I have to just like dream big, right? Like just ask mm -hmm. the person that you want and see if they'll. The worst I can say is no, and Although, yeah, somebody responded, um, congratulations on your book, but then didn't a answer the question about the blurb. And I'm like, that's a no then, right? I guess so. I <laughs> that's a no. <laughs> yeah, I um, I got rejected by two of my blurb writers. Um, one of them, I just don't know if they ever got my email, um, which is fine. I, I think that it's someone who doesn't write blurbs, really. And the other person was very nice, but they were like, I'm doing too much. I don't have time to write blurbs, which I said, that's totally fine. Um, but yeah, I, I I felt like that too. The blurb thing is really scary, I think. Um, I only asked one person who is actually the poet we discussed, Torin Great Greathouse, uh, was the only person I didn't like know personally who wrote a blurb for the book. 
Uh, the other people, like one of the people I know very well, and one of the people I know through TikTok. So, you know, it was, it was close enough. <laughs> I was like, I feel like I, I'm comfortable with who y'all are. But that was really scary sending it out to people I'd like never met or talked to in real life before. And I was like, do you know who I am? If not, here's who I am. I don't know. <laughs> That's a weird thing to ask. Do you know who I am? If not, it's fine. But we're Twitter mutuals. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you um are you still on Twitter? Are you sticking it out? Um yeah, I mean, only because of this book. <laughs> Cause like I have like I've spent the last decade building a network of poets. Right. I don't have time or energy to go build. I'm gonna like do. I'm gonna put more energy into it next year of like trying to really make it happen on threads and I, whatever. But um, I feel like people didn't really leave. I think people pretended to leave and then kind of were like, I'm gonna come back to Twitter. <laughs> um, but Twitter's. I mean, Twitter, and then I think like my biggest platform is TikTok. Um, or some huge ways I've actually like got gigs. Um, I, I'm like, again, like I'm a weird, intense and also delusional person where I am definitely the sort of person who I'm like, invite me on your podcast. Um, invite me to your reading series. And I mean, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm like reaching out, uh, individually to a lot of places as well, but you never know who you're going to like get from that sometimes like I, I've been invited to some cool stuff just by saying like hey let me do this and sometimes people will say oh okay thanks for asking yes yeah. you never yeah, know yeah you never you you never know I, I I love that I need to I need to remember that more yeah. in the things that I, do. I mean I I think the problem of course is that like it's difficult not to feel like you are the like being annoying or being overbearing or whatever um but at the same time like I think of the fact that like you know I know what McDonald's is I know I know what they do I've eaten at McDonald's I know their vibe they will not stop advertising to me <laughs> I see McDonald's ads every day everywhere and I, you know, like I'm better than McDonald's. Um, maybe that's a, that's a bold statement, but you know, like, <laughs> I, you know, maybe I also deserve to talk about myself or to like advertise myself or market myself, um, you know, and, and hopefully it's something more nourishing than McDonald's. We'll see. Um, not to, I love the chicken nuggets, sweet tea, <laughs> beautiful stuff, but yeah, I don't know. Like, I think we shouldn't be um, afraid there was a really cool, speaking of like marketing stuff, um, there was a like tweet thread on, you know, on Twitter that really spoke to me. Uh, it was by the poet Chen Chen. And he was talking about how, you know, when you're like marketing or when you're like putting your stuff out there, I think people think that it is egotistical to market yourself or to say, hey, look at me, I've done this thing. But um, he kind of made the point uh, that I agree with that it's like more egotistical not to market yourself because you kind of believe that you're so great and so smart that people are just going to like come to you. They're just going to know by like looking upon your face, like you must be so intelligent. You must be like have this amazing thing. But if you like refuse to tell people about what you're doing and what you want to do and putting yourself out there. Um, you're not even giving people a chance to like get to know you and your work. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good point. That's what and I tell myself at night, anyway. Yeah. Is, you know. <laughs> it's an act of service. <laughs> it's you know, it's it's humble. <laughs> well, I don't want to assume anyone, you know, you can't assume someone knows who you are or knows your work or anything like that or has read your work. Um it's it's I think good to go into things and continually introduce yourself <laughs> to the world. That that's a that is a great thought and feels like a nice place to wrap up because um because I'm really glad that I got to know your work better and yeah. got to also know um Torine Greathouse's work better with the Burning High Bun this evening. Yeah, I'm glad too. Thank you for having me. Yeah.
Thanks for coming. Wow. What a great interview. I feel really inspired to go out and try my hand at a burning high bond or maybe writing some poems using computer coding as the structure. Who knows? What I do know is that Evelyn Berry's Grief Slut is out from Sundress Publications coming in 2014. 2014? What just happened there? Time travel, time travel. <laughs> 2024. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by.